When we were discussing white horses last week, we dropped a hint about the topic of this week's episode. Though it probably wasn't entirely recognizable as a hint. And there was no necessity to figure it out. And we didn't let you know there was going to be a hint. So it was more of a passing mention, really. Never mind. See, one of the white horses we discussed was Pegasus, and in telling his story, we had to discuss the Chimera very, very briefly. We know it wasn't much of a discussion, but that's okay, because we fully intended to expand upon it this week. No, really. It wasn't like we were desperate for a topic this week to fill a gap because we totally miscalculated the number of episodes needed for this month. Not at all. Not even a little. Totally planned. But once again, our previous selves had made things difficult for us. We've discussed the Chimera before on this show in prior episodes. Well, actually, the discussion is spread out across a bunch of different episodes in which we highlighted some of the Chimera's parentage in one place, its siblings in another, and some of the generally weird stuff in Greek mythology elsewhere. That's the trouble, though. It's been scattered all over the place from episodes so old we didn't actually have scripts for them, because they already existed on one of the Angry GM's websites, to slightly more recent episodes that retread old ground even then. Except it was new old ground at the time. See Typhoon Revisited, for instance. Never let it be said, though, that we've told you absolutely everything there is to know about a word with nothing left to say. That just isn't true. There's lots more to know about any number of topics we've covered, and we always, always encourage you to do your own research on the topics we present. It's entirely possible to learn new, surprising things that we haven't seen yet and expand your own personal knowledge of the topic at hand. We highly recommend it. In any case... We think the Chimera is interesting enough to do a revisit to pull together information we tossed into random episodes along the way. In doing so, we can present some Chimera-related information and stories we haven't done before. Because the Chimera, representing as it does a number of different animals melded into one, and which ones it is depends on what source you look at, contains interesting lessons about the nature of nature that we as human beings would do well to remember. For example, in Dungeons & Dragons, the Chimera is a three-headed beast comprised of a dragon, a lion, and a goat. The dragon head spews deadly substances according to its color. The lion head bites, and the goat head attacks by... well, sort of sleeping a lot. For reasons which are unclear. They did give it dragon wings to fly badly with, though which is nice. It's interesting to encounter one the first couple of times, what with the flames and the burning and the claws and the teeth and the snoring, we guess. But after that, it's kind of samey. Once you've beaten a couple of chimeras, you pretty much know how to beat every other chimera, and it all becomes a little routine. However, few people remember that, according to Ed Greenwood in Dragon Magazine issue 94 from February 1985, Chimera can crossbreed with two other monstrous creatures to present more of a challenge to the sorts of adventurers for whom regular chimeras have become too routine to really bother with. And the resulting creatures, while a definite kind of horror all their own, only get more so when you consider that biologically, because the different animals can crossbreed, they must all be related on some fundamental level. The first walking horror show of a crossbreed is the Gorgomera cross between a chimera and a gorgon. The big metal murder bull kind, and not the kind with snakes for hair, thankfully. I mean, could you imagine? The other crossbreed, designed specifically to give your players nightmares, is the Thessalmera. A cross between the chimera and the already nightmare fuel Thessal Hydra. A hydra with a 20 foot long body and nine heads eight of which are on ten-foot-long necks surrounding the ninth, much larger head. And a tail pincer. And acid breath. Which eats regular hydras for breakfast. At least they replaced the stupid sleeping goat. With about a hundred hydra heads. But one thing is clear. The designers of D&D had no idea how genetics work because only one of those crossbreeds makes any sense at all. But they were close. 
This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. The original Chimera, as you might expect given last week's retelling of the Bellerophon story, is a Greek invention. As such, it is deeply rooted in Greek mythology and tied into many other Greek stories as the offspring or relation to one or more of the major players in that mythology. In fact, mostly Greek mythology is a giant game of who do you think you are, except you always end up being your own uncle, cousin, sister-in-law because the Greek mythological family tree doesn't so much branch as perform a series of complicated multidimensional loops back on itself. Everyone is related to everyone else, and as proof, we offer up the genealogy of the Chimera. It goes as follows. Typhon challenged Zeus as head god of the Greek pantheon, but lost. And as we've discussed in other episodes, Typhon is basically a giant snake monster made by the interbreeding of Gaia, the Earth, and Tartarus, a storm-filled abyss. Or possibly just Hera all by herself. Anyway, as punishment, he is cast down to either the depths of his father, Tartarus, or possibly just Mount Olympus, where it lives on biding its time, or, or being eternally tormented. Look, it's complicated. And then Echidna, who we've also chatted about before, comes along. Echidna is born of... Well, we may have used it's complicated too soon in this story. Echidna is either the offspring of the sea god's Keto, a possible daughter of Gaia, and Forcus, whose mother is also Gaia. And they shared the same father as well. Or, Echidna is the child of Calero and Chrysor, who you'll remember as the barely relevant brother of Pegasus, both of whom were somehow born of Medusa during her beheading. Or, or Echidna was also the offspring of Gaia and Tartarus. At any rate, the two of them, Echidna and Typhon, hook up either under Mount Olympus or within Tartarus himself. And now that the story is in full-on ick mode, let's move on. Echidna and Typhon set about having children, the first of which was Orthrus, a giant two-headed dog which you may remember from last week was hanging around guarding a bunch of cattle that Heracles had to recover as part of his many tasks. Then they have Cerberus, a three-headed dog set to guard the gates of the underworld. And the third child is the Lernian Hydra, on which every Hydra you know is based. Cut off one head, it grows two more to replace it, etc. Clearly, the couple are genetically predisposed to bear children with multiple heads. Fine. At least, each of the monsters appears to have a single head type each, all well and good. And then along comes the fourth child of Typhon and Echidna, the Chimera. It has the head of a lion at the front, the head of a goat coming up from the middle of its back, and the head of a snake at the end of its tail. And there's no real explanation for this, it just sort of happens. Except it might be that Typhon started fooling around on Echidna, with either Keto, one of Echidna's possible mothers, or the Hydra, his own daughter. And then, as if that weren't bad enough, the Sphinx and the Nemean Lion are born next, and they might have had either Typhon and Echidna as parents, Typhon and Keto, Typhon and Chimera, or they might all be the offspring of two-headed Orthrus and some combination of any of the three at-hand females, still all we think inside their grandfather Tartarus, the swirling pit of storms, where they are all meant to be serving some sort of punishment, but really who's in charge of keeping an eye on all this? It's all gotten totally out of hand. At some point, everyone loses track of all the shenanigans, and by the end, Typhon and Echidna are supposedly responsible for the births of 12 monstrous offspring, including Gorgon, the mother of Medusa, who is supposed to be the grandmother of Echidna in the first place, and how does that even work? As you can see, the creators of Greek myths didn't know anything about genetics either. In 1854, an Augustinian friar living in a monastery in the Austrian Empire planted some pea plants and fundamentally changed our understanding of how life passed on traits to subsequent generations. Prior to that, it was well understood by farmers and ranchers around the world that if you wanted more of a thing with a particular set of traits, you needed to breed two of the things that already had those traits together. If you wanted a cow that gave you a lot of milk, you needed to start with cows already known to either come from cows that already gave a lot of milk or that gave lots of milk themselves. Want a dog that was good at scent tracking? 
you need two dogs that are already good at it. Well, technically what you needed was more than two. Two just wasn't enough to get a new kind of dog that was really good at following its nose. You needed a couple of generations at least. This was because part of what you were doing wasn't just selectively breeding for dogs that were good smellers, you were also deselecting dogs that weren't. And it seemed that every so often dogs would come along in what you thought was bound to be a good litter of dogs with excellent noses that weren't so hot after all. Those had to be eliminated from your breeding pool. In essence, you needed to guarantee that any dogs produced from any given litter of good candidates would breed true and not produce a ringer. The same thing applied to plants. If you wanted to ensure that your next crop of peas was juicy and full of nutrition, you needed to start a few generations ago to ensure that you bred out all the terrible peas that were gray and disgustingly mushy in favor of all the ones that were nice and round and green and popped when you bit into them. The early pastoralist and agricultural societies were genetically modifying their crops and livestock by selecting for the traits they wanted so long ago that by the time Gregor Mendel planted his first crop of peas in 1854, he wasn't really trying to work out how to do it, he was trying to work out why it worked and what the hidden process was that powered it all. By 1856, he had narrowed down the characteristics he wanted to test. Each of them seemed to occur independently of any other pea plant characteristic, which meant that nothing else seemed to interfere with them. They could be looked at, experimented with, and conclusions could be drawn from them without fear of some contaminating characteristic messing up the results. He chose seven of them. Seed shape, flower color, seed coat tint, pod shape, unripe pod color, flower location, and plant height. By observing these, and then artificially cross-pollinating plants with different or similar characteristics, he could observe what changes occurred and how truly they bred from generation to generation. When he crossed purebred white-flowered pea plants with purebred purple-flowered pea plants, an astonishing thing happened. Instead of getting a plant with a flower that was an average mix of the two colors, which is what everyone thought was the way it worked, he got entirely purple flowers in the first generation. The purple had taken over from the white. Therefore, Mendel called the purple color a dominant trait. That is, a trait which, when present, will be the trait expressed regardless of what other traits are available. Then, in the second generation of these plants, he allowed them to self-pollinate and discovered something else amazing. Rather than getting more plants with all purple flowers, he got three plants with purple and one with white. It seemed that certain hereditary units, which today we call genes, were transmitted from the parent plants to the next generation. Certain genes could have more than one form, called alleles, and these were the deciding factors in what traits would appear in the next generation. Mendel's experiments led him to come up with three laws, today referred to as Mendel's laws of inheritance. The first law is the law of dominance and uniformity. If two parents are purebred for one genetic characteristic, say one purebred white flower and one purebred purple, all first-generation offspring will exhibit the dominant trait purple because they all carry the alleles P and W for purple and white, and purple is dominant. This is one way to determine which of two purebred characteristics is dominant over the other. You've probably had some experience in high school biology with mapping out the likelihood of the blue eye trait in the offspring of parents where one is purebred for brown eyes and one for blue. Brown dominates over blue, and no blue-eyed children are born. Mendel's second law is the law of segregation of genes. This law explains that when genetic information is assembled within the cells of a new organism, the alleles involved are separated from all other possible alleles so that only one version of the possible combinations is used in creating the new individual. Half the alleles come from the father and half from the mother. So, in second generation pea plants, when two P and W plants breed, they produce one of three possible outcomes. One in which both P alleles meet up, two in which one P and one W allele meet, and one in which two W alleles meet, leading to three plants with purple flowers and one with white. One of the purples is a purebred, containing two dominant P's, and one is a pure white, containing two recessive W's, with no purple to dominate them. Again, in high school, 
you probably also mapped this out with two impure brown-eyed adults producing three brown-eyed and one blue-eyed offspring. The third law is perhaps the most easily understood. The third law basically says that having one set of traits doesn't automatically mean you have another. It's the law of independent assortment, and it means that each set of possible genetic characteristics sort themselves independently of every other set based on what genes and alleles are available from the parent organisms. A pea plant, if allowed to reproduce naturally on its own, is no more or less likely to have purple flowers in a tall stem than it is to have white flowers in a short stem, just because it has one flower color or the other. Purple flowers don't automatically mean tall plants. Each characteristic occurs independently of every other characteristic. Which, thinking back to the chimera, is kind of interesting. Remember that Tython and Echidna had three children that were certainly almost definitely just their children. Orthrus, the two-headed dog, Cerberus, the three-headed dog, and Hydra, the first three. Now, certain bits of information can be gathered from these first three children. First, they all had the multiple head trait. Second, they all carried certain snake appendage characteristics. Orthrus had a snake tail. Cerberus had numerous snake heads placed about his body, as well as a snake-like tail. And Hydra was pretty much the dude I heard you like snakes of snake-based mythology. So if we wanted to, and we thought such silly thought experiments might tell us anything about Greek mythology and the genetics involved, we might say the snake-like appendage trait and the multi-headed trait were dominant. Certainly, if you look at the parentage, snakes and multi-headedness are two of the biggest characteristics. Both Echidna and Typhon were a hundred snakes for a head on a human body. We can't really go back further than that to verify, because the likely parents of both Echidna and Typhon were well, concepts and abstract ideas, and it's hard to perform a paternity test on that sort of thing. So we have to assume that multi-headed and snake appendages are dominant traits, meaning Hydra is perhaps the purebred form of the resultant offspring. Because look what happens next. Chimera comes along and is all jacked up. Lion body and head, snake tail, random goat stuck in the middle. Where did all these other traits come from? Something hasn't gone right, clearly, and her parentage is in question. However, Typhon is sometimes described as having a variety of other heads in among his hundred snake head, and these include things like lions, bulls, and dogs. That must mean genes for these sorts of things are in his system. It would explain why Cerberus and Orthrus were born with dog bodies. So we're prepared to say at least this much about Chimera's parentage. Hydra was not her mother, because being purebred, the dominant snake genes wouldn't have allowed the expression of recessive traits. And it seems unlikely that Echidna was either, for similar reasons. Though Echidna is obviously not purebred, she carried dominant snake genes. We think it has to be Keto, the primordial ocean goddess, who, being a primordial being, with at least one bit of weirdness in her genetic makeup, her mother was Gaia too, probably didn't have the necessary genes to assert themselves when Typhon came calling. So, all his recessive animal genes got to come out and play. After that, all the parentage is in doubt, and you get weird things like the Sphinx, a couple of dragons, a lion, and the still inexplicable Gorgon, which doesn't make any damn sense at all. Anyway, not too long after Gregor Mendel works out his genetic rules, he gets a promotion at the monastery, which basically takes over his life, leaving little to no time for his experiments. He writes everything down, of course, but when he dies, he's in the middle of a tax dispute with the state, and his successor burns all Mendel's papers in an effort to end things. Most of it is believed lost, never to be seen again, and his work is mostly forgotten. Fortunately, in the early 20th century, scientists rediscovered some of Mendel's work and began developing the field of genetics once more. Of course, with any system of such vital importance as the passing on of genetic information to create new individuals, things are bound to go wrong. And while the body has a number of systems in place to catch and correct or eliminate such errors, some inevitably slip through. 
Take, for instance, mosaicism. Mosaicism arises when one egg produces a group of cells with two or more distinct sets of genetic instructions. It's an error in cell division at a very early stage of development and can lead to a number of difficulties affecting a variety of cells in the body, including reproductive, blood, and skin cells. Some of the conditions which can arise from mosaicism include Klinefelter syndrome, in which males have an extra X chromosome, Turner syndrome, in which females have a missing or partial X chromosome, and Down syndrome, in which the individual has more chromosomes than needed. There is, of course, a sort of opposite to mosaicism. In this instance, the difficulty arises because there are two different, completed sets of DNA in a given individual. Often this is because two different zygotes, the cells that are created when the male and female reproductive cells meet, are created at the same time. Normally, this would result in some form of twins being born, but sometimes one cell is absorbed by the other. Other causes can include the absorption of some of the developing cells by the mother's body, or the adoption of the mother's normal cells by the developing embryo. It's called chimerism. There are usually no outward symptoms or distinctions, and it may never be discovered unless the individual has a particular reason for its discovery, such as blood matching. But sometimes it can result in intersex conditions in which an individual has reproductive organs from both sexes. And although there are only about a hundred chimera cases officially known, at least two cases have come up in which women have not, on initial testing, appeared to be the parent of their children because of DNA differences between the two sets of DNA in the mother's body. And fascinatingly, receivers of bone marrow transplants can change their blood types to match with that of the bone marrow donor instead of their own. Oh, also, in 1984, scientists combined two different animals to get one creature in one of the earliest chimeric experiments. Researchers at the Institute of Animal Physiology in Cambridge, England, combined two separate animal embryos into one, effectively creating a single creature with four genetic parents that survived into adulthood as a chimera. The popular press called it a geep, because it was both a sheep and a goat. You have been listening to GM Word of the Week. You know what to do if you like what you've heard. Thanks go out once more to our supporters, both on Patreon and elsewhere. If you'd like to help support the show, head over to our support page at gmwordoftheweek.com by clicking on the yellow banner at the top. Any of the options presented to you will be a wonderful choice and also prevent you from hearing ads about amazing mattresses that spring forth from very tiny boxes just like the one you didn't hear in this episode. Good job, gang. Good job. This episode was researched, written, rewritten, rewritten again, and then produced by Brian Casey, quite possibly the goat. Although probably not. Music was provided by the fine folks at Blue Dot Sessions, whose new website is up and available to you right now. Check it out at sessions.blue Finding his mind so filled with chimeras and fantastic monsters one after another without order or purpose he decided to write them down not directly to overcome them but to inspect their strangeness at his leisure <laughs> <laughs>